Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah? I hope you're enjoying future prop tech. Um, I'm Derek Tate. I'm a director at PwC. Uh, I'm not an accountant. Um, I lead our facilities management strategy and transformation team. Um, I advise a range of clients on their real estate and facilities management. I've worked in FM for over 20 years, um, doing a number of projects. I, I am the RICS author of the professional statement on facilities management procurement that was published last year, and there'll be an update coming out later this year. Um, in my work, digital technology is something that's increasingly part of the conversation. Uh, every client I speak to, every company I speak to, wants to talk about prop tech. As such, I'm delighted to be hosting this uh, panel today, and I hope you enjoy the, the conversation and uh, get what you need from it. Huh? Joining me in the panel today, in no particular order, we have uh, Oliver Ridgewell. Oliver is a director at Trimble Real Estate and Workplace Software Solutions. He's been at Trimble for 10 years and works with a range of technology, including Manhattan IWMS, HoloLens Augmented Reality Platform, uh, 3D modeling, uh, and other systems. Also with us is Kate Smith. Kate is head of Workspace UK at CBRE. Uh, Kate leads the UK Workspace Advisory Team, helping clients to define workplace and user experience strategy, um, exp wellness and change programs, occupancy data, etc. Kate's been working in FM as long as me, also 20 years, uh, and has worked at a number of really interesting places, BBC, Barclays, Johnson Controls, Cisco, amongst others. We have uh, Chris Moriarty. Chris is the Director of Insight at the Institute of Workplace and Facilities Management, um, until fairly recently known as BIFM. Uh, I have to remember not to call it BIFM anymore. Uh, previously, uh, Chris was Managing Director at Leesman, um, where he's responsible for creative and strategic development of the Leesman brand. And last but not least, we have uh, Herman Knievel. Herman is the Global Open Innovation Customer Lead and Head of Innovation in the Netherlands for ISS. Herman is a leader in the field of collaborative innovation, corporate startup collaboration, and partnerships for innovation and outsourcing. Herman is also a, a jury member in the European Prop Tech Awards at MIPM. Okay. Um, the topic today is Prop Tech, the engine room for growth and facilities management. Uh, me personally, I, I think it very definitely is. I think 2019 is a pivotal year. Pivotal year. I'm seeing more and more prop tech, more and more people are wanting to talk about it. And, and I think it's just, it's interesting why this is and what's driving it. Huh? So to, to kick us off, Kate, perhaps uh, you could give your views on what you think is, is driving the prop tech in FM now? Sure. Um, Henry asked for a show of hands from the last one around who's in the room. He didn't ask the most important question. Who is a facilities management professional in the room? You want to put your hands up? Oh, Yay. Oh, we've got a few. Well done. Oh. A few there. <laughs> I think uh, what we've done, uh, and certainly over my career in facilities management, is come out of the basement. So don't get me wrong, I still love a good conversation about bogs and boilers, but actually, through iterations and iterations, we're out of those basement offices now. We are showing as facilities management how we are relevant and driving change, and we can be the change agents through every type of core business. Um, we've had those kind of injections of sex appeal from um, corporate social responsibility agenda, from well-being, and now kind of the ultimate one uh, is this user experience, so the rise of the workplace consumer. And it really means that the stuff that perhaps 10 years ago I was spending 10% of my time talking about is the conversation that every occupier, investor, um, service provider wants to talk around, around user experience. And each time we've had those injections of trends and those enhancing our relevance as facilities management, we've been supercharged with technology. So with the user experience, absolutely, there's still the focus on service from facilities manager. There's still the focus on buildings. We need to do those. But actually, it's around that that user-centric service design and supercharging the way we deliver services in facilities management with technology. Um, there is that underlying discussion which we all enjoy as facilities management around margins, and it is traditionally a lower margin business, so you really do also have to use the technology to see where we can keep innovating around cost as well. So those are kind of the big drivers for me, the corporate social responsibility, wellness, the rise of the workplace consumer, and that ongoing efficiency agenda from facilities management. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Um, Herman, from ISS's perspective, what, what are you seeing as the latest trends and drivers? 
Well, uh, I agree with uh, Kate said so far. Uh, that's what we see as well. Now, of course, we're in a business with high volume and low margins, of course. So maybe technology can drive that forward. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the way we work uh, currently with some of our customers in open innovation and with innovation, it's also about uh, growing together. It's also about how can we win together on these topics because it's about, uh, of course, transparency, uh, predictability. It's about uptime. That's the basic, of course. And we're focusing more and more on user experiences, running from a service company to an experience company and delivering communities in a bit. Um, and driving also the, the social responsibility agenda, the well-being agenda was mentioned before in the talk uh, of Emma uh, as a trend in the business, the, the well-being uh, of all the users and the employees in the buildings. They're spending most of their hours in buildings, but we're talking about food, we talk about support, <coughs> we talk about what we do outside the office, but not in the office. Mm -hmm. So PropTech can help uh, to drive that agenda, definitely. Uh, but I think we need to take a step forward in how we work together and how we innovate together more in a collaborative way to win together as well. Good, thank you. Yeah, I agree. I think wellness is also very high on the agenda at the moment. Um, Chris, what do you see from um, institutional <laughs> workplace and facilities management's perspective? Um, I think I might just turn my microphone off. No, I'm here. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I can't disagree with what we've heard so far, and, and it's always it's only worse going last on a panel like this when you're asked the same question four times. <laughs> um, but the, what we are seeing is this sort of, uh, and what captures what we've talked about already, is this reframing debate. So what actually we're seeing is professional, FM professionals, workplace professionals, whatever you want to call them, reframing what they're doing. So um, it is that shift away from um, managing the, the building to within an inch of its life and get the cost all the way down to saying to organisations, um, actually, we can help you with your performance. Um, I don't buy into the fact, though, that this is a, uh, an employee experience revolution. I don't think this is new. Uh, it's just new to us. Um, I spent 10 years with the Chartered Institute of Marketing prior to joining this world, and uh, marketing was a profession that was under, uh, understood, under-recognised, undervalued, um, and for them, 10 years ago, uh, sorry, about, probably about eight, six years ago, um, technology was their catalyst to change the conversation. Now I'm at pains to, to suggest that this is, it should be seen as a catalyst as opposed to the driver. Um, the, the, I mean, the, the idea that the, it's the engine room for growth in FM, I think that's a title you can pick apart a little bit because I suspect there's a great swathe of uh, people that work in the facilities management family who are probably going to lose their jobs because of prop tech. So certainly that doesn't suggest growth to me. The, you know, it depends on what we term growth. But that's, that's the direction of travel, I think, is that we are seeing technology being used to enhance experience. That experience is allowing us to have different conversations with the organisations we either work within or work for. Yeah, OK. And, and Oliver, what are you seeing in the workplace? So I, I think to tr maybe try and knit a few of those um, things together and picking up on the hopefully not too many job losses item, but I, and you know, if you throw back to many, many years ago, whenever you see these sort of changes in technology, generally you find that people don't just lose the job, they go and find something better and, and more useful to do. So hopefully um, the continued emergence of more innovative prop tech will actually generate um, just maybe in a slightly different way to we, we expect. But um, I think stitching a few of those ideas together is, um, it's, I think we have come as, as an FM industry from um, the, the basement to the boardroom, as, as you put it. And a lot of that is to do with the fact that prop tech allows us to um, gather an extraordinarily high volume of data. And when you're presenting then into the, into the boardroom or C-suite, however you wish to, uh, to refer to it, um, it is data driven. And so the, the trend for me is taking that data and um, to coin a, a colleague I used to have to, to turn that into wisdom um, as opposed to just a, a whole heap of numbers. And that's consolidation of information relating to your facilities, to the condition of your facilities, to how people are interacting and utilizing those facilities, and ultimately into some of the more um, intangible elements like why people would want to then actually work for your business and work in that space. And I, I think that's where you're starting to knit you know, really tangible um, facilities management data with the kind of more in, intel, intangible well-being, happiness, 
um, sort of metrics. And that's the trend now is consolidation um, and understanding, um, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I think we, we need to remember that at the end of the day, a lot of facilities management is about people and people in buildings. And technology is about working with people or helping people to work. It's not, it's not about replacing people as such. Eh? Um, I mean, Kate, what are your views on prop tech in the workplace, particularly around how it can, you know, enhance environmental impact, improve wellness, etc.? Um, there are so many examples. I would actually one challenge I had recently talking to a big um, sort of farmer organisation was challenging every element, every service line within facilities management, and they would say, "Oh, there's there's no innovation in that in that part. We've done it the same for ten years." So actually, I think. All of us can challenge ourselves. Is there anything we've done the same for 10 years in facilities management? And is it right for innovation? Um, I think the gamification, Emma touched on that element. There's some really nice examples of how we can change behaviors, actually encourage wellness behaviors, um, habit forming, using the gamification of technology, and equally drive some of the, the productivity around our service delivery using technology as well. Great, thank you. Um, what, one thing that I think is really interesting with PropTech is what impact will this have in the actual industry? And, and there's a number of areas there, including um, you know, the actual company development, merger and acquisition activity, um, changing skill set, etc. Um, if I can start with you, Herman, I mean, what, what, what impact do you think this will have on companies like ISS or, or other large and small FM companies in the industry? Um, a big impact, a big one. Um, we're a human-to-human -human company by nature. I think ISIS, we serve our customers and uh, employees around the world. Now, but for, for 80K people working for ISIS worldwide. So, uh, by nature, in a human-to-human -human company, uh, but technology will help us drive uh, to perform and to outperform what we do today. And the mothership is working on that and trying to improve that uh, by building uh, <coughs> our global data platforms and, and have the local flexibility to build upon that and to aggregate and to do your analytics and to steer into the right direction uh, on the premises, on the site, uh, but also on the contract for a customer. Uh, but what I also see, I work um, outside, I'm with one leg outside the company. I work in a, an autonomous unit uh, of ISS, directly um, uh, linked to the board, so we have uh, Group C level support on that. And there is where we work on different topics. There is where we talk with our customers on, on winning the war for talent, for example. How can uh, a facility or how can a workplace, how can the, the experience um, uh, drive uh, talent attraction or retain the talent? Because that's on the uh, agenda of our customers at the moment. It's also the sustainability agenda. It's also about well-being. But there we particularly look, how can we solve challenges and evolving needs over time? So it's not about the problems of today. It's about the problem that, that's on the agenda for tomorrow and the day after. Thank you. And uh, from CBRE's perspective, Kate, do you, do you think that it's seen as having a big impact in the industry? Absolutely. Um, I guess you, you've seen each of the, the sort of the big facilities management or corporate real estate service <coughs> providers have that innovation think tank area. We'll also have investment funds. Um, we're all investing in kind of seeding prop tech, growing those, making acquisitions, partnerships. So um, I, the numbers that, that we all invest in prop tech are astounding and something that our customers are all really interested in and absolute they are an engine room for growth in what we deliver. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. All, all the clients I work with, they're, they're the corporate occupiers are asking their facilities management companies to bring them solutions. Uh, maybe, maybe they're specifically highlighting technological areas or they're just asking for increased value and a lot of the way to deliver that is the prop tech. So I, I see it becoming a, a real driver for facilities management. I think the FM companies are, are the customers or the clients for a lot of the prop tech companies out there. Um, what I wanted to ask next, uh, perhaps to you, Oliver, is do you think there's disruptors out there that are really going to disrupt the established FM companies? I mean, is, is, there, is there an Uber-type company knocking in the door that's going to change everything in a few years' time? I think there's about 40 companies out there who would like, <laughs> to, <laughs> like to be that Uber-type company that disrupts the industry. Um, look, there's a huge, huge amount of development going on in the, in the different technologies that are, that are available, whether that's focused on... Know, BIM to FM, augmented reality, more mobility, um, understanding the, the impact of well-being. 
Um, I was chatting with a colleague who I'm here with today just earlier, and you know, we've been presenting at this show, or he'd certainly been attending this show for the past 10 years. And uh, I think it wasn't cool to come to a prop tech show maybe 10 years ago, and now it's full of uh, you know buzzing startups that have got all sorts of ideas. So, um, do I know of that Uber in the FM industry? If I do, I will invest. <laughs> but I, I don't know of it yet. But I have no doubt that there'll be something that really um, is able to disrupt. And I think there's. There's, there's such a plethora of information, like I said earlier, that we already collect in the FM uh, space that we really need to take that, grasp it, and truly drive the change to, to make sure that we're, we're really um, designing and building and maintaining the property um, and the, the infrastructure that we have in a way that best delivers for the customer, which is very often you know, the, the knowledge worker in, in, the, uh, in, in the environment. They need to not only get out of it a place to work, but an environment that's conducive to the job that they're doing and fits quite often nowadays with their lifestyle expectations. Um, and that's, that's a, I think, a, anyone who can really truly sort of crack into, into that mindset and understand how the workspace is, is truly delivering for the knowledge worker, then you, you're going to have a, an interesting piece of information there. If, if I can just ask anyone on the panel, do, do we think there's any particular FM services more susceptible to disruption than others? All of them. Yeah. I mean, we did it. We did a study looking at technology, and we. And the reason I kind of talk about job losses is, isn't to jump on the on the train that everyone's going on. Is we we applied a, a test that McKinsey did, uh, and McKinsey did a big report on on the the nature of jobs moving forward. Now, what we're talking about, you're right. It's not uh, jobs don't evaporate. They, it's job displacement. So. Um, you were doing this, but now you're going to be doing that. But the reality is I can't see how it will displace within our family. It will go somewhere else. But we applied it to, uh, essentially it's a test where you, you look at how predictable something is as a task, how repeatable it is, and how much it requires a human touch. Um, and what you found in that is that some of the things that we associate with, the, the I guess, the more senior, the more um, uh, strategic role that we want FMs to play, they, they kind of are protected, you know, because they need things like change management skills, project skills, all the rest of it. But when you start going a layer below that, things like catering, cleaning, security, asset management, all of that stuff just flagged up red because it is just so replaceable. And the, the example, um, the, the best example I heard, I was talking to a chap from Honeywell who was talking about Shanghai offices and they've got a, a robot now that does all their hospitality. So as a, as a guest <coughs> arrives, that person, facial recognition, it knows who you're meeting, it'll arrange all that for you, it'll t point you towards a coffee. Um, which, I, you know, he's telling me this stuff and I'm, I'm impressed because I'm a geek. And then he says, oh, well, the best thing is it's got cleaning pads on the bottom, so it's cleaning reception all day as well. So you just start counting up the number of, of tasks involved with that. And Herman, you know, you're head of innovation at ISS. Are you telling me you haven't looked at robots? Right? You've I see the right flex. I totally agree with you. Yeah, so, yeah. You're, you're, definitely. you're looking at robots. Yeah, definitely. But it will always be a combination between human and yeah. tech. And we need to find, the, cock it we up, need to find the right balance in that because yeah. I don't believe that it will be every, uh, no, no. for example, an hotel will be only robots when you enter an hotel. It will be a combination yeah. to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the red flex, definitely. Yeah. 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 Funny enough, I have been in a hotel in the Netherlands where there's no receptionist and you, you print your own pass, check yourself yeah. in, Eat check yourself hotels out. in France did it. Yeah. Yeah. It's efficient, but you miss that human touch as well. Right? Um, Herman, maybe a question for you in your, in your role. Um, do, do you think FM companies are, are ready for prop tech companies, for prop tech startups? I mean, you know, these are small entrepreneurial mm -hmm. companies. They're still growing. Oh. They're not typical corporate companies. Yeah. Are the large corporate machines ready to work with them? Um, I don't think so. Not mm -hmm. yet, not yet. Uh, it's, it's growing. Uh, when you look at uh, corporate startup collaborations, so to say, or collaborative innovation, uh, when corporates and startups meet, it could be through challenges, other open innovation programs. There's a lot of love in the room, especially when a customer is in. There's so much love. Uh, only the thing is, the day after, uh, the business kicks in uh, and we're back to normal. And then how do you grow on that, on, on the love? So how do you go from a love stage into a marriage with, between a corporate and a startup. And that's quite difficult, actually, uh, because um, the, the, the corporate immune system, so to say, um, is always present. <laughs> it, it's, all, it's about compliance, it's about legal, it's about procurement, and especially if, uh, we, um, if you look at the market, how we procure uh, innovation, we go for the traditional 
uh, uh, in the traditional way what I see happening, and it's the volume. It's a buyer supplier game. But on the other hand, you're trying to solve a big problem. You're trying to reach uh, your Mount efforts together, so to say. You need to build something, you need to create. So that you need a different way of working, a more collaborative way of working, and then you need to go for a partnership and more uh, into a relation with, between the corporate and startup. And then you need to play the trust game. You need to play the trust game. It's about the transparency and the cultural fit. And that's a new way of working uh, in, in, in general for corporates and startups uh, because it, there's a lot of potential, uh, but still, uh, we're not good enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, Chris, I think one for you, just as, as facilities management becomes more technologically enabled, I, I almost said it probably they're technologically enabled. Um, and more and more prop techs working, the, the skills are going to change, the requirements are going to be changed. I mean, from, from the Institute's point of view, uh, how will the industry and the Institute respond to this? Uh, well, in the same report that we I just mentioned, we, we actually did a little bit of a, a kind of a, a pulse check on people's either awareness and knowledge of, of different technologies. What we found was, awareness-wise, um, the profession is focused on prop tech, which I guess is good news for you guys. Um, and there was sort of indifferent um, responses when it came to how comfortable they were with it. So we, we certainly need to, to bed, uh, and we're doing a whole competency review at the minute, so we're, we're going to embed more of that into it. Actually, I thought what the most interesting thing with that same question, though, was the almost um, ignorance that was applied to technology that's going to make a better workplace <coughs> experience. So we're all talking about this workplace experience thing, but um, FM's kind of said they didn't know much around things like automated vehicles, chatbots, uh, AI, machine learning, all this sort of stuff. Um, and we kind of could almost draw a distinction between technologies that enable an FM to do their job better, there was a good awareness and, and acceptance of, but anything that enabled everyone else in the building to do their job better, there was kind of a, an ignorance of. And I think, you know, the, the, I, I, I'm uh, a passionate leader of, of this kind of shift from the traditional FM to the workplace mindset. But I do think we need to be temper that with the fact that people that sit on stage tend to be the people at the forefront of that, and actually the masses underneath it, there's still a long way to go. So from a skills perspective, we need, I would, I would elevate above the need for technology understanding things around experience engineering and, you know, and, and uh, psychology and organisational psychology and all those things, because they set, the, they set the, the, the cornerstone for any technology solution you're bringing in. I think we'd be in trouble if we went technology first and then tried to retrospectively craft an experience around it. If I can add something, I, I think you make a great point and one of the biggest errors I've seen with taking technology in is not actually having the people who are going to be the recipients of that technology understanding why and how and um, you know, what, ex what changes they should expect. If, the, if they can't understand that, they won't grasp it and they won't take it on and they certainly won't buy into the deliverables that it has. So that's a, it's a really important point. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, I mean, who, who, who is the customer for this technology? Who is the customer for this prop tech? You know, is, is it a landlord? Is it a developer? Is it an occupier? Is it an FM company? You know, who, who's going them. to actually engage yeah. with them? Every yeah. single one. Yeah. Yeah. It depends what, what, what piece you're bringing in. It can be, you know, if you're consolidating that data to make an evidence-based decision about what you need out of your workspace, then it's, um, you know, it's, it's the boardroom. If you're trying to put something in the hands of the, the, um, every employee that makes their day-to-day -day life um, better, easier, simpler, faster, whatever it might be, then it's, it's every employee in those businesses. If it's trying to streamline the way that an organization can look after um, the buildings, then it's the, it's the FM, the asset manager, um, and, and so on. So I think it's every single one of those. Yeah. Um, I, I guess the actual building user can drive some demand as well, because they, they've maybe worked somewhere else where there's a piece of technology makes their life easier. They come into a different workplace, they, they want to see it, huh? Yep. You don't, you don't like moving somewhere and... Uh, Find it hard to do your day job. I, I was um, at an organisation not long ago, and they'd recently um, released. It. They'd built, moved into this beautiful new building down in uh, down in Sydney, part of a major redevelopment down there. And they'd released an app that, like many organisations do, replaces a security card, so you can tap the app. But what it also did, which I thought was quite quite unique from what I'd, I'd seen, I've heard people talk about these things, but it was 
quite unique um, for me to actually see it was it connected into a whole host of things about the building. So yeah, great, I could book a room, I could book a desk if I needed to, but it also, because the building had a gym in it, I could book my gym class through it. Yeah. Um, and uh, it synced up and pulled data from, my, from, um, from the watch that um, people were wearing. So, you know, I count my steps, I do my running, everything like that. Mm -hmm. And part of that was if you um, did, went to the gym, if you did these steps that's all about being a healthy person as well, you actually got rewards for that. And those rewards you could either convert for food at the canteen um, or you could get vouchers out um, and go shopping with that at the end of the month if you'd achieved a certain score. And so that whole environment was not just showing that you know, the business wanted to um, make sure they used the app to get in, but also to actually try and encourage them to, to live a slightly healthier lifestyle, which ultimately yeah. is benefit for the individual's well-being, the productivity of the business. Um, I've heard a lot of organizations talk about that. That was the first time I'd seen it okay. truly in place with the gamification in that. Yeah. And, and Kate, are you seeing this? Sorry. Are you yeah. seeing this in the workplace? Absolutely, yeah. and that's, I mean, that's uh, some of the product development that I've been working on is that services um, enabled by technology. So as you say, it is um, putting services and amenities in the hands of the service users, but also then the supercharging the services with all of that data, with the access to that. There is the elements of chatbots, et cetera, in there, managing that, doing the, the auto-routing of, of work requests, and the wealth of data you get at the same time as improving experience you can then learn from that, you can apply that, you can smart schedule your services accordingly, you can right size your service facilities, rooms your availability, uh, you can see now um, zombie bookings, which is a new thing to me, yeah. um, so the, the no-shows effectively and who's driving those and why they're arising. So there's just so much insight that, that we've been digging for and thinking that we understand instinctively as facilities managers that the apps which provide a great user experience that help deliver now give us those insights that we can really learn from. Yeah, I agree, and these are great examples. Um, however, um, I don't see them a lot because this probably is on the table with a lot of corporates around the world already for years to build that app for their community in their workplace. And there are so many roadblocks in those organizations. Or if you want to do a security test in a global organization or to do the compliance or the, the build the aggregation or data layers on top of the app because the app is only maybe 5% of the work and 95% of the work is the inter internal stakeholder management and building those aggregations and, and building those a APIs. So I think we need to overcome that. That's a big challenge in, in our market. Uh, I, I think what I come across with our customers, it's uh, the legacy systems uh, and the legacy way of working uh, before all those great examples you mentioned, and uh, I love it. And so I've only seen it once. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here, only once. Come on. So we need to uh, move the needle yeah, together. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I think we touched on it earlier, but we, we need collaboration between developers, landlords, service providers, occupiers. How, how, how can we encourage that? How, how can we see it? There's a, I think there's a, an ever increasing demand from the end work, from the, from the workers in those in, um, organizations for improved technology. Um, it's one of my biggest <coughs> frustrations when I turn up and the internet doesn't work or I can't, there's no stuff in the printer or I can't find where my desk is that day or, you know, all those sorts of things just impact m whether I'm going to go to the office or not, right? So um, <coughs> I think there's a big push that'll come from the, the individuals and I think there's then also the top down, um, where the, particularly um, organizations that are in that kind of desperate need of attracting the talent, yeah. uh, the top down recognize that more now. That's why we're talking about it here today, uh -huh. um, largely because that push is there. Yeah, I mean, what, one of my observations in the workplace, as we become more agile and work from home and work remotely, etc., when we are in the office, we need to be more productive. You know, everything needs to work. We need to be able to do what we need to do. So I, I think it becomes more important then as well for the workplace. There's a huge amount from what, if you look at retail, and I think some of the conversations mm -hmm. in the other rooms around cities and shopping centers and high streets, all of that, you can almost, read any presentation or see anything around what's happening in retail and put workplace and office particularly in there. So it is about creating experiences that pull people yeah. to be in the workplace. Because um, otherwise you can connect virtually, you can do a lot remotely. Um, the way that we will be able to collaborate <coughs> virtually in terms of avatars, there's gonna be your kind of your trophy hub workplace, your co-working and virtual. 
how do we connect those and make that kind of continuous, authentic experience as a facilities management team? And I think the partners you spoke about all need to work together. You've got to throw HR and digital and technology into that mix within a corporate real estate. Uh -huh. Then you might get some magic, but yeah. yeah, it's rare to find. I think you've got to add marketing into that as well. And, and it sounds like an odd thing because typically in your business, they're looking out the way. Um, but that, that's a profession that's been mapping experience and, and dropping technology into it and, and enhancing that experience for, like I said, like, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. I mean, they've, and they've made massive mistakes like Bluetooth messaging and, um, you know, QR codes. I think we're the only profession and in, in industry still uses QR codes because certainly no consumers are using them. I made that mistake at an FM conference once. I said, oh, who's ever used a QR code? <coughs> Everyone put their hand up and it completely fell flat. But um, I think we need to look at it. But I also think as well, you know, it's great hearing all these examples of flashy bits of kit, but I think we touched on it in that there's, uh, I, I remember talking to someone who was trying to get workplace as a concept into their business, and they said, talk to me about how you can improve productivity when you can make sure the toilets are clean. And I, and I hate using those sort of examples because it doesn't do FM any favours, but there is a kind of hierarchy of you need to build up. So it's all right having an app that can you know, open up a, a barrier to let you in, but if the Wi-Fi doesn't work on floor three, then that kind of looks like you wasted your money on one bit of kit and actually you should have probably focused on that. There's nothing more infuriating, I'm painting myself as, I'm not as grumpy as this normally, <laughs> but you know, the amount of times you, you go to a train station, someone's obviously had the idea that, you know, let's put Wi-Fi in at the train station. There's nothing more infuriating than Wi-Fi at train stations because they want to know every single thing about you. Um, you're only there for a couple of minutes waiting for your train. But by the time you've put the mm -hmm. information in, you're already off the platform and you lost your Wi-Fi again. So we don't do enough time sitting and going through this and going, well, how will this feel? And I just think marketers, you know, that's their training. Mm -hmm. So it's a great group of people for us just to talk to and say, hey, look, we're thinking of putting this in. What do you think are kind of the behavioral challenges that we'll come up against? Okay. Um, we're nearly out of time, but I think we've time maybe just um, maybe one example of some really good innovative technology that we've seen. Um, Kate, we were talking earlier. I think you had a good example. Oh, we had a nice conversation about toilets again. Yeah, yeah that was what we do in facilities <laughs> management. Um, uh, there is um, a company out of Germany that's doing um, uh, augmented reality for cleaning, so kind of gamification. So you might be available, uh, aware of Pokemon Go. Everyone's had a look at that, or kids have had a look at that. There's a version that is being applied to cleaning now, so surfaces can appear red that need cleaning. Um, there will be some, something or someone to follow in an augmented reality fashion to show the route for cleaning. So I thought that was quite an innovative use of technology. Great. Okay, I, I don't think my kids will be playing that like they are Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> can I add some one example yeah, sure. to this? Um, it's something we all produce, uh, everybody in the room does, in every workplace and office. And uh, that's about waste. It's about food waste. And there's a company here in London, um, um, it's called Winnow, and they bring AI to our kitchens, the large kitchens, oh, wow. not only ours, but also other kitchens, uh, also in hotels, uh, but also on cruises. And with their technology, they can capture exact what uh, the food waste is. So, um, and we are an execution company, we can execute quite well. But on top of that, they can, uh, uh, have a, it's about 30% improvement on food waste. And food waste is so high on the agenda yeah. for us as a society. So look those guys up, Winnow, they're in London, doing great stuff. And AI into the kitchen, <laughs> so cool. Good. Thank, Thank you, everyone. We're deep into overtime. So yeah, if you, see want, if you want to see some great technology, <laughs> the Trimble stand is just down the stairs <laughs> on the left-hand side. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to jump in there because um, it's got a terrifying, like, was a terrifying shade of red. Um, so thank you so much to the panel and to our moderator. Thank you very much. 